Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day. We thank you for your word, this beautiful word. We send us your spirit that we might be moved and that we would hear um, what it is that you would have us to hear in this text this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's text uh, reveals to us reveal to us two miraculous stories. And I will leave it up to you to decide for yourself which is more miraculous. One is a supernatural event with the creator of all that is, the creator of the world and all that is in it, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The other is merely a rec reconciliation of two estranged Brothers, one is a formative event a, in the founding of a nation, one where the name that will become a people is assigned, where a unifying principle and value of that said nation is given. The other, as I said, is just a reconciliation of two estranged brothers, no more than that and no less than that. But it is a confrontation that has been building for many chapters and also many years. At least 20, at least 20 years has this estrangement been the case. We know for sure about Jacob's activities for and measure of it for at least 14 of those years because he was working for his wives. Let me remind you a little bit about Jacob's story and how he and his brother have become estranged to begin with. Many of you read this just last month, but I want to refresh our memory with some of the main points. Jacob and Esau are twins. They shared a womb together. Esau was born first and is covered with red hair. This is a mark of him to be the red man. It's actually what his name is and his generations to come after him will be called. Jacob then is second, and he is born holding on to the heel of his brother. That is the name that he is given, Jacob, Yaakov, grasping at heels. It is the name of a trickster. It is the name of a swindler. It is the name of someone who would trip someone else in a race just to take their place. That's what the name means. We see Jacob doing this exact thing to his brother two more times in his life. The first one, Esau is out hunting. He comes back hungry. He says famished is what the Bible tells us. Jacob is home, being his mother's favorite cooking some stew. You wonder if he's been cooking it from the beginning or if he's just stirring it. Esau begs him for it, but Jacob says, I'm not going to give you any of this unless you promise me to give me your birthright. Esau does. Esau says carelessly, what need do I have of a birthright? In this moment, I am starving. The second time is later, Isaac is dying, he's blind, he's old, he sends Esau out to hunt for some tasty game so he can have his favorite food one last time, one last good meal, he can bless his oldest son as his heir and his promise, his hope. Jacob and Rebekah, their mother, she favors Jacob, probably because he's always there to stir the soup. <laughs> She plots to fool Isaac, and Isaac being blind and old, they fix for him the best food, his favorite, while Esau is supposedly out catching it. And Jacob, not Esau, goes in to serve it to Isaac. Rebekah dresses Jacob in Esau's clothes so he will smell like Esau. 
But also since Esau is a hairy man, at Jacob's request, she puts goat furs on his hand so that if Isaac would touch Jacob, he would feel hairy like his hairy red brother. This works. This ruse works. Isaac bestows upon Jacob and not Esau the blessing. When Esau comes back and finds that there is no blessing left, he says he's furious with Jacob. And he plans to kill Jacob as soon as Isaac kicks off. As soon as his father is dead, he will take his revenge. Now their mother, Rebecca, sends Jacob away to her brother Laban. And there are two slightly different versions about why Jacob goes. One is that he's fleeing from Esau, and the other is that he does, his parents don't want him to marry a Canaanite woman. You need to go somewhere else to get a woman who is not Canaanite. Despite what the reason is, either of those are fulfilled. Because Jacob does get a wife. In fact, he gets two wives. And like his grandfather Abraham, there's also a situation with two of the handmaidens of these two wives. Four women. One caravan. Bless him. <laughs> so at the time of the reconciliation with Esau, that makes today's readings... Esau, uh, Esau, I mean, Jacob has two wives, two handmaidens, and 11 children from all of them in this happy caravan family. Happy. But at least the family is returning home after 20 years away. Jacob, who has found some fortune, decides that he is going to gather all that he has, all that is, all that he has been given, and that's considerable. This has been a productive 20 years for him. He devotes pieces of his possessions, and he wants to give them to Esau in hopes to make peace with him. He wants to buy him off. He wants to make a peace offering. He wants to buy his way back to find peace with his brother because he is still living in fear of what his brother might do to him. And for good reason. Esau is strong, Esau is angry, Esau is powerful. And why would he not still, after these 20 years, want Jacob dead? We know what Jacob has been doing for 20 years, right? He learns that others can be tricksters and swindlers too. His mother's brother Laban is a match for Jacob in his tricking. Jacob falls for Laban's daughter, Rachel. He pledges to work for seven years for the right to marry Rachel. But when the seven years are up, Laban does the old switcheroo. And he switches the older sister for the younger, and Jacob somehow marries the wrong daughter. What's good for the goose is good for the gander in these nighttime switching of people. Then, Jacob does another seven years of work, and finally, at the end of those 14 years, marries the love of his life, Rachel. There is another, there, there's other conniving and sideways dealings that take place between Jacob and Laban. They're always working to manipulate each other to get the best of each other. That's the world that Jacob has been living in for these 20 years. The world of politics and scheming and gamesmanship is all that he knows, and he thinks this is the way that he must act toward his brother Esau. Because how else than through scheming and bribing and exchanging of goods can people be brought back together? Such things take a miracle. But on the night before the meeting, ja Jacob has another encounter that will change his life forever. In what Tom read, this begins in 32.22, and it says, That night Jacob. That 
that broad crown now reference, that is referring to all of the preparations that Jacob has made, the offerings that he has brought together to make peace with Esau. He hopes that the next day, after bringing all of this stuff together, the next day he will meet his brother, buy him off, and pay for his forgiveness. But that night, he sends his wives and everyone ahead across the river, and he is there all alone. And while he is alone, a man appears and they wrestle with each other. Actually, if you read the text, the man doesn't even appear. They're just wrestling with each other. Listen, this is beginning in verse 23. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. We don't even get to know where this man comes from. He was alone, and then all of a sudden he's wrestling. It goes on. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. And as he wrestled with the man, then the man said, let me go, for it is finally daylight. It's daybreak. It's morning. Let's give this up. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. All right, there's nothing all that strange here other than the pop hip and, and, the, and this strange man being there out of the blue. But when Jacob won't let go, the man basically says, I am renaming you Israel because you have wrestled with God and with men and you have overcome. How? How does he overcome and how does he wrestle with men and with God? The answer, by not letting go. He asks the name of the man. The man says, why do you ask my name? And then the man blesses him. And the newly named Israel, formerly known as Jacob, the artist formerly known as Jacob, the wrestler formerly known as Jacob, calls the place where all this happened, Pen El, the face of God, <coughs> saying, because I have seen God face to face. So this man that's just there, doesn't appear, is just there to wrestle, is God. Without there ever being a claim saying, I am God, there are details that show that it's God. Israel has seen God, struggles with God, prevails by not letting go of God, and is blessed. And the blessing is sealed with this limp that he will carry for the rest of his life, as my song I sang a little bit ago suggests. Mark me in my sin. Marked in his sin, this swindler, this grasper, this man out to buy his brother's forgiveness, this man with a dysfunctional family life, to say the least. None of that seems to matter. None of that seems to matter in the blessing of God. So what does matter? It's difficult to say, right? It's difficult to say what is it that matters because it's so strange. There are three details, though, in this story that offer some possibilities on why this matters in terms of blessing, on what Jacob might be that's different. There are three diff details. Number one, is it the promise? Jacob, now Israel, is the child of the promise that we have seen all the way back from Abraham. And that promise has already defied the odds a number of times. Whether it's Abraham and Sarah's old age, whether it is their, her barrenness, a thousand things have had to be overcome to get to this point, this very point. So why not here, right? Why not here? God's mysterious will is being acted out. It's certainly more powerful than any human sin could ever be. The will of God must be done. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's what makes Jacob different. Number two, what about Jacob's humility? In the prayer he prayed. I skipped over that in the choosing of the text, 
But there's a beautiful prayer that Jacob prays earlier on in chapter 32. In these verses that are so strange, before this strange encounter, before this reunion. He prays this. O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, who you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, which cannot be counted. That is Jacob's prayer. You hear that? There's humility in that prayer. There's a lot of humility in that prayer. There's a lot of asking for God. There's a lot of confession in that. There are, there are the words of, of lessons learned by life and experience in that. There is a bowing down before the will of God in that prayer. There's also a little reminder of the promise, right? Remember your promise to my fathers and your promise to me. So you can say that one and two, the promise and the prayer and the humility are related. Maybe so. But I said there were three. What about the third? Jacob just will not let go. He won't let go. There's something in that. Jacob, something in Jacob that makes him hang on. No matter what, no matter the odds, no matter the cost, no matter what comes, Jacob is going to hold and fight for what is his. He becomes a wrestler with God. Not just in action, but in name. Striving with God, struggling with God, not letting go of God, and the nation that comes from Jacob will hold that moniker as well. Israel and the Israelites, the people who struggle with God. What a struggle that is. So like many th things in the Bible, when you pose three possibilities, each work on their own, but they also work in concert and in parallel with each other, and speak to something really important about faith and life and the life of faith. God blesses Abraham, one, because it is his will and his promise, two, because, or sorry, God blesses Jacob, Israel. One, because it is his will and his promise. Two, because he is humble and asks in prayer. And three, because he just never lets go. Think about that in the life of the Israelite nation. Think about that in the life of a hundred other biblical characters. Think about that in your own life. Do you struggle with God? Do you fight with God? Do you question God? Do you wonder about God? Do you scream at God at the top of your lungs? God, I just don't understand this. I don't get this. I hate this. Why would you do this? Why would you let this happen? Why would you let this be? How could you dare take this from me? How can I live my life without what others have had? Why do I need to be singled out to not have what others do? And that have might be a job, it might be wealth, it might be a father, it might be a child. How can you, God, just sit back and do nothing about this situation? Not only does God not get offended by such behavior, he blesses it. He blesses it. Because it is engaged. Fighting with somebody is engaged. Wrestling with somebody is engaged. 
And engagement is faith. It's blood, it may be blustering, it may be screaming at the wind, but that is so much better than disengaging and walking away. Don't ever let anyone tell you that when you are angry with God, that you shouldn't be. And I'm sure there have been people along in your life that have told you, now, 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 shame, 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 don't you say that. Be honest. God knows anyway. Bluster, scream at the wind, just never let go of God. Because he won't let go either. O oh God, your steadfast love. Let the redeemed of the earth tell about your steadfast love. The wrestlers, the fighters, the strugglers. Humble, yes. Praying, yes. But fighting and never letting go. This is part of the will of God. Man, that's an amazing. And it gives shape to the nation that follows. And it gives shape to our own relationship with God. But for some reason, God in his infinite wisdom and power and grace, as the poet of the universe, and of this his holy word, for some reason, he puts that story in the middle of this other one. Like jammed in there, like a weird interlude, like a halftime show that doesn't make sense. Like, here it is. Football, 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 boom. Rihanna. Yeah. Football, football, football. And I actually like it. I'm not going to But it doesn't have anything to do with the other. Or does it? Maybe not in the Super Bowl's case, but in this. He's building up the gift and the suspense over the reunion with Esau. He's worried over it. Jacob's prayed over it. He's prepared these gifts, these outlandish gifts. He's even sent his own family over ahead. He does all of this right before the wrestling episode. And as soon as the wrestling episode is over, he looks up. Tom read them together because they are together. Right? I gave them to him as if they were two separate readings. But Tom's smarter than that. He read them together because he knew that they were contiguous and they are. The wrestling story ends the end of chapter 32 and the first verse of 33 is Jacob looked up and there he saw Esau. There's no rest for the weary who's been holding on and wrestling with God all night. There was Esau coming with his 400 men. So Esau's got an army. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front. Then Leah and her children next. Then Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Why? Because he's feared for their life and he cares more about Rachel and Joseph than any of the others. That politics has already started. Way before the amazing Technicolor dream code has ever been crafted. The favoritism is already rearing its head. He himself went on ahead, bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Seven times. Look at that fear and nervousness. Bowing down to the ground seven times just in the approach. He's still far away and he's bowing down. Then in a scene whose only comparison is from the New Testament and Jesus' parable about the prodigal son. Verse 4, but Esau 
ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau is forgiven, Jacob. He looks around, he's like, what's all this stuff? Who are all these? Jacob says, this is my family. And what's with all this valuable stuff? These goats and sheep and livestock. Jacob says, I brought, I brought this for you. Esau asks, well, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? Jacob says, to find favor in your eyes, my lord. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. I already have plenty, my brother. Remember the, in the prodigal son, when the older brother says, this son of yours, this son of yours has been out prostituting himself and wasting all your money? Here is Esau saying, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. He doesn't want it. He's got enough. He has his own story, and his own story has brought him joy and much. Time has healed the wounds because God has provided Esau like he provided for Jacob. And the time and the experience have healed him. They've, they've healed any animosity he could ever have had. The problem of forgiveness is not with Esau. I almost named this sermon Zoom Out. Because that's what I'm always telling my kids when they're fighting with each other on the sibling rivalry. Hey, y'all, zoom out. Take a little bit of perspective. Live a little bit of life. Realize that this sister that you're fighting with is on your side in a world of a thousand people who will trick you. Billions of people who will trick you. The problem of forgiveness is not with Esau, but with Jacob. Can Jacob forgive himself? How amazing is that in this story? How amazing is it in this story that all of these details about Jacob come to the, come to the, to the forefront? Jacob as the child of promise. Jacob in his humble prayer. Jacob in his not letting go and wrestling and struggling with God. And finally, Jacob holding on to guilt that he shouldn't. All four of these things are essential to the life of every Christian I've ever met, and certainly myself. We come to Jesus, off, sometimes offering a thousand gifts and things because we want to make it right. But the one thing that we can't bring is the understanding that he has forgiven us and loves us in ourselves. We hold on to guilt that maybe we shouldn't. And God says, I have plenty. What could you give? And often the gifts that we bring are not for God, they are for ourselves. Just like the gifts that Jacob is bringing Esau are not for Esau, they're for Jacob. Buy my guilt, pay for my sin. We have the beginning of the Christ story and the understanding of God right here in Genesis. Just like we did last week with the sacrifice of Isaac and God coming and saying, no, no, I will provide the lamb. I myself will provide the lamb. Here we have the free offering of grace 
outlined in parable and story from history. So we have to ask ourselves, in the face of Christ and His grace, do we see ourselves as part of God's amazing plan? Are we humble on our knees, praying to God for our salvation and deliverance? Do we hold on, standing though we are humble, although we are on our knees? Do we hold on, knowing of our value and our importance to the plan, do we hold on to God through whatever happens? And finally, number four. Can we forgive ourselves? Or believe that ourselves are already forgiven? It helps in the way that we see ourselves and our relationship to God. And it also speaks volumes about our relationships with each other. May we live into the life of Jacob, no, Israel, struggling with God because he cares enough to struggle like that. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we see around us a thousand, a million, an infinite number of things that we do not understand. Help us to stay humble in the face of that. Help us to see your work and your plan unfolding even when we don't understand it. Help us to hold to our place, to struggle, to fight, to claw, but never let go, never walk away, never grow despondent, never be like the wicked in Psalm 1, blown by the wind, but instead rooted always by your living water. And we, may we start to begin to believe in the miracle of forgiveness, both in the way that we forgive each other, and most importantly in the way that we forgive ourselves. That forgiveness is not something to be earned, but to be bestowed. Important for the giver and for the given is a reconciliation, and in reconciliation is the miracle. <clears throat> because we see the elves happen around us so much. Grudges, battles, disagreements, taking lives of their own. Reconciliation is the greatest miracle. And it is shown to us through Jesus Christ. That being known, we pray for those around us who are struggling with loss, with disease, with pain, with grief, <clears throat> with medical procedures that seem to be endless, or waning days that seem to be hopeless. May we continue to struggle through them all, holding on even until the last breath. In this moment of silence, may we pray for those that we know are in need. Father God, know our hearts as we know that you do. You know our insides, you know the words that we might bring to our lips as thoughts before you even consider speaking. You hear us, 
you know us so well. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven,